I prefer now to like not deal in regulated businesses because sometimes when you have the handcuffs of the government on you, it becomes really, really challenging. Welcome to the Dispensary Marketing Podcast, where we interview the top dispensary owners and experts in this space so that you can stay up to date with the latest trends and strategies that you'd otherwise miss out on. I hope you enjoy this episode. All right, Jazz, thank you for hopping on to the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. Um, you know, uh, it's an honor to have you on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Great, great. So you and I, uh, we've known each other for a little bit, but the audience doesn't know you at all. Um, so please, uh, can you tell them who you are, the name of your store slash stores and where you're located? I am uh, Jazz Samra. I own uh, five stores. We have locations uh, in Etobicoke, Mississauga, Kitchener, St. Catharines and Belleville. Awesome. Awesome. So what was your background before getting into the cannabis space? A uh, lifelong entrepreneur. So I've done various mm-hmm. different types of businesses. Uh, first started off in publishing and ad marketing and advertising and then uh, owned a couple of like personal injury law, immigration law firms, uh, been involved in restaurants and nightclubs, uh, movie film production for a while, done a lot of personal development and motivational speaking work as well too. Then, uh, My last venture beyond this was uh, a real estate firm that I used to manage uh, a big team of real estate agents and was their coach and mentor to help to teach them the skills to be successful. Right. So, so walk me through your first business. What was the, what was your first business like and how did this spark the rest of your entrepreneurial journey? First business was, uh, I was 22 years old, Mm -hmm. uh, Originally, it didn't start off as a business idea or anything. I was uh, studying in uh, in BC, and uh, a friend of mine asked me for help. His name was Omar. He's, he was very involved in his mosque there. And this is days before pre-internet and all that stuff. And uh, he asked me to help him on a project that he was volunteering on. And uh, basically what they were doing, they were creating like a Yellow Pages type of directory for the members that were part of the mosque. It was the businesses put in some ads to help pay for it, but they basically made a list of all the the people. It used to be called the White Pages way back then. I don't know if they still, they don't have it anymore, right? But it was just a, 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 if who you are, your address, and your phone number, right? Right. So we just made a, a little booklet. It was about, I think, 80, 90 pages. It wasn't that... Uh, big but it was very well received and then from Mm -hmm. that we were like hey this is a a good little project maybe we should do this for like the bigger indian community uh per se so yeah we just invested i think it was like 23 dollars at the time to print business cards nice and just kind of turned it into a business and we had no money but uh we did have a little book to show as an example to people what we've done and just told them we want to do it at a bigger level and uh, in the beginning, not many people thought we were going to be able to do it because obviously you're just only 22-year-old kids, really, right, with uh, no previous business experience or anything. So uh, it was a challenge to get people to give us money in advance. So they would say, yeah, no problem. When the book comes out, I'll give you the money, but here's mm. my ad kind of thing, right? So mm. uh, we figured out ways to uh, to make it work. But even in the beginning, I remember this – printing out the invoices like you had to i don't know if you're old enough to remember but it used to be three or four sheets carbon sheets you'd have to write it on and then give one to the customer one yeah. to the accounting department and one to the sales rep right for the record so we had to do like a contra deal where we put an ad in for the printer and he printed those things out for us and right. that's how we kind of got the business started but uh, after the first year uh it was became very successful. It doubled in size the second year. And then uh, we started uh, another business out of it was like a newspaper. People were like, hey, you have so many contacts uh, with advertisers in our community. We don't have a newspaper. Why don't you guys start a newspaper? So we're like, okay, let's start a newspaper. So we started uh, a newspaper that started out as a once a month paper. And then it became twice a month and then it became a weekly and then soon after that we started a second newspaper to kind of be our competition as well too and then the Pepsi Coca-Cola Pepsi yeah and then uh, then we had two successful papers and then we decided to start 
uh, a third paper in our ethnic language, and none of us spoke the language. Uh, we spoke the language, <laughs> but we couldn't read or write it. So okay. we just hired, we just hired an editor that knew how to do it. Right. And uh, basically, what we would do this is all like pre-internet days. We had uh, relatives in India that would every day gather newspapers for us and literally ship them out uh, to us in Canada. And he would read the news from what's happening mm. back home and retype the stories out here to let people know, uh, keep them updated on what's happening back home. Right. right. That was it. Yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, quite different in those days doing publishing uh, business. I remember at one point we had uh, two offices, one in Vancouver, one in Surrey. And during a snowstorm, we had, uh, it was publishing night and there was a night where we had like a half page ad that had to go in the newspaper. We literally had to drive, print it out in Surrey and drive it for an hour to, to the Vancouver office where that's where the, the paper was being templated to, it, to do that. So I think I've learned a lot of lessons on uh, hard work <laughs> from then. Right. So it's crazy how fast paced information moves these days. I mean, you're saying yeah. you had newspapers flown over from India, yeah. had to get it delivered, then you had to get it transcribed, then edited, um, then translated, 100%. then you publish it, and then it gets out to the people. And it right? was one month one month old half the time to use right? yeah. by the time we got it out. Right? But, <laughs> it's insane. But it's that's insane. how the world the world used to be such a big place. Yeah. You know, yeah. just like thirty years ago. And, yeah. Uh, I'm lucky I went to Vancouver for my uh, Christmas holidays with my family. The newspapers are still there. The directory is still there. It, it, it felt good to see nice. the things that you gave birth to and were your first ventures uh, nice. in business to still be around. So two 22-year-olds investing $23. It was um, three, do you three, three of them. Oh, have... three. Three yeah. 22-year-olds. <laughs> do you remember approximately how much money um, you guys made back in the day from, you know? From oh the my business? God. We didn't really, for the first year, we really didn't take out any salaries. Mm -hmm. I I got uh, tasked with the task of staying home and being the graphic designer. Mm -hmm. Never operated a computer really in my life. So we had to go and figure out how to buy a computer and learn how to use Corel Draw at the time software. So I was uh, the one that kind of learned the computer side and both my friends uh, ben and Omar, they did most of the sales side, so they were on the road uh, doing sales. We paid for our car or gas. We were all living at home, right? So we really didn't need big salaries and stuff like that. And we were all brown, so we don't pay rent at home, right? So, it's, <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, we managed to get by uh, pretty slim because we didn't have a lot of uh, income to start with, right? People were very reluctant. If an ad was like $500, they want to maybe give us $50 as a deposit and mm -hmm. then they want to see the finished product come out. And uh, I remember the finished product was, was a story I tell a lot of people when we actually had the directory uh, sent to the printing press. I think we printed 30,000 copies of it then, and it was going to cost us $40,000 to print it. And we had like $500 in the bank account, right? We had no money in the bank account. And what happened was we're like, okay, go ahead and print. It was a big company called Ronald's Printing. The the salesman there became uh, a friend of ours. And uh, we gave them a check. Back then it was all checks and stuff that was written. And uh, they started doing the work. They did all the prep and whatnot. And about two weeks later, our check bounced. Right? It was like for $5,000. And the guy called me back. He goes, Jazz, your check bounced. And I'm like, Oh shit! Really? Okay, I'll write. I'll write you another one. Yeah. And then we wrote another check, but they were continuing to do the work. And by the second time, the second check bounced as well too. But by that time, they were already like almost finished. They had finished printing all the books, but they hadn't like saddle stitched them and like trimmed them and all that stuff. So we had to make a deal with them. We say, sorry, we don't have any money actually. So he's like, okay, you know what we'll do? We'll make these uh, 30,000 books for you, but we'll release you a, a dollar a book. So we would mm. go, we paid him $500. He'd give us 500 books. We'd then take those to our advertisers and say, see, we got it. We made it. Give us the money you owe us and then take that money and literally go pay for the printer and then 
get those books in our hands. And then uh, it was quite the task of actually like manually delivering them uh, to the community as well, too. So, right, right. Yeah, it was very different the way that business was done. <laughs> I don't even think people could do that like that anymore. I right? can't even imagine it, most people, right, that it was like that. Yeah, look, it's it's slightly different, right? I mean, you know, uh, a little bit further back, it was more of the barter handshake agreements. Hey, mm. you know, we do this, we do that, and now it's it's not necessarily you know, yeah. that case anymore. Yeah. So you, um, at the beginning of this interview, you said uh, you you yourself were a serial entrepreneur, um, and this was one of the businesses um, that was your first one. Mm. So. What about building your first business made you want to continue to build businesses down the line? Uh, I think the good thing that happened to me was the business that I got involved in, we were dealing with other business people, right? So mm. we grew up like, I was like three, four years old when I came to Canada, but my parents are totally illiterate. Most of the people that came during that time have no education. So we had no role models. We're kind of like a we were called like Generation Y or something, right? Just a confused generation of how to fit in into like Canadian culture and still right. be tied to parents that don't even speak English uh, here and are very much connected to what's happening back home and almost afraid to let their children out into Canadian culture because it's natural to have a fear of the unknown, right? So uh, we were lucky that uh, I got to deal with people that own businesses. They could little bit below role models for us and we would learn from them experiences we would learn like who what types of businesses do well what makes somebody successful uh, i originally was on path to uh, to want to be a lawyer but we dealt with a lot of lawyers in our directory and after dealing with them i was like oh my god there's no way i want to be a lawyer because i seen the way that their life is and what their offices are like and how much stress that they had and all this. And it was like, no, I don't think I want to do this as my career. And uh, just learning to be really good at networking and building relationships. And uh, when you start doing that, you start finding more and more and more opportunities uh, out of it, right? Sativa Bliss is actually, I think, one of the only businesses that I've created that was not through any contacts or being at the right place at the right time for an opportunity to start a business. It was just something that I created a business plan for right. protecting right. per se. But yeah, when you're in an industry where you get to know so many different people, we know politicians, we had newspapers and a variety of different types of business entrepreneurs, opportunities kind of come your way and then you kind of pursue them mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. well too. One of them we got involved at, uh, my immigration business, I had to do it because the people that were advertising with us were in debt to us by $30,000. They didn't pay for their advertising bill. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to help you guys and become a partner and get you out of this hole. At least hopefully I could get paid. But it was ended right. up being one of the best businesses I started. Oh, there you I go. never would have done that unless they had advertised with us and were in the hole to us for for that much money. And they just took me on as a partner. And uh, we grew the business to amazing levels. Well, it's almost full circle. Like when you went to uh, the, the the book, when they were creating the book for you guys at the beginning, yeah. you're like, hey, I don't have this money, but you know, <laughs> we have to sort something out. So you see how yeah. that kind of comes full circle, right? 100%, yeah. 100%, yeah. <laughs> so um, when it comes to the, on the dispensary side, right? Mm -hmm. You said you didn't open this up with... Um, or this was the, the first business you opened up without any connections or any networks or stuff like that, right? So what were some of the, the challenges that you had to face like in the startup period to kind of get things off the ground? Licensing wasn't that big of a challenge. Getting the license yeah. was relatively easy. The other challenges seemed to be the getting the real estate. That wasn't that hard either because I had my real estate license and knew right. uh, quite about real estate. But learning retail was a challenge. I had never done a retail business mm. before. Uh, obviously, learning cannabis was a challenge. I don't consume cannabis at all. And in my life, I think I'd only consumed it maybe two or three times, a puff here, a puff there, knew nothing about uh, about the plant, right? It was actually CBD that kind of turned me into this industry and started looking at it. But uh, yeah, I quickly learned and uh, built a good network of friends that have done this before. And uh, we kind of work together, support each other. And uh, I'm a constant learner, always learning all the time. And 
a lot of the skills that I had learned in my previous businesses, I was able to bring to this business. So it's personal development. I was a sales coach. I was helping teams uh, grow all these types of things, customer service. I think customer service applies in any industry, regardless of the type of business you're in. So, right. Yeah. So on that side, then, what would you say are the keys to running a successful dispensary? Oh, my God. There's so many keys, but there's so many things that are out of your control that determine whether it's going to be successful or not. Right? Uh, I think ultimately your location is your biggest factor. You could be a not so great operator, even a horror. I know some horrible operators, but they have amazing location and it's high foot traffic and people are just walking into the stores and, mm -hmm. uh, and buying stuff. And then you could have a great operator. And I, I don't want to say I'm a great operator. I know lots of people that are better than me. And they have multiple locations. But every single location performs drastically differently. Even though it's the same systems, the same operations, everything in place. It's because that location made the difference, right? Mm -hmm. So location is your number one thing. You could be the best operator in the world. But if your location is not good, you are not going to see those uh, results. Because cannabis kind of turned into... Uh, a convenience store type of model where people tend to go to one of the three or four dispensaries that happen to be within a kilometer or two of their house is the one that they tend to frequent the most. Right, right. So that's one of the things that I find difficult about this industry from a retail perspective is you can't really go out and get business. You're mm -hmm. like, a lot of times you're sitting for customers to come into your store. Whereas I've always done business where I can go out and and get it. Like real estate, yeah. you go out and you find your clients. Immigration, you go out and get the business. This is like you're waiting for them to come to you. So I've never been in that type of uh, industry before. And I find that to be one of the biggest challenges of it. Right, right. So on the side of now getting people to come in through the door, right? Exactly what you mentioned. Location plays a massive part. Um, how you treat your customers, making sure they keep on coming back, making sure you have good quality product, making sure your pricing is aligned with the competition, so on and yeah. so forth. What would you say are like your, your main pillars of marketing to get people in through the door who might not even know you exist in the first place? Well, we actually just took our window coverings down in our store, so that, <laughs> okay, that, there you that, go. that, that made a difference. Yeah, right? There's people that actually started coming in that were afraid to come into the stores before because they were worried about what's behind uh, these dark dark windows. So that, that helped. Uh, there are lots of people that are shopping online nowadays uh, just through the mobile phones. I think uh, it's important to have... A, a good menu that reflects the community that you're in. Hmm. You can't just say, hey, I want to be the craft guy that is high-end product. But if your demographics in that, you know, one or two square kilometers does not match that, then I don't think that's the right uh, menu for that, uh, for that market. So, yeah, you do have to pick and choose uh, the types of business and model that you want to have based on your market like Louis Vuitton's not going to open a store in, in my plaza over here, right? They're going to go to Yorkville <laughs> and, and and do it there, right? So I have to right. cater to to cater to my customers in the, the neighborhood right? to try to deliver them the products that they would be looking for and be able to afford. And then after that, it's just customer service. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the important things that I taught my staff with customer service is I took gave them special courses on. How to be a good listener. I think listening is one of the most important uh, uh, skills that somebody can learn uh, when they want to be good at customer service. And the second one, which is a really simple thing, but not many people pay attention to it, is uh, I taught them how to remember our customers' names. And that was really important. And uh, when a customer walks into our store, the moment they walk in, they the staff will like yell their name from afar. It makes the customer feel good, and it makes them feel like uh, that they belong in the store and are welcome here. I got that from that TV show, Cheers. Right when there's a, I think the theme song is "You want to go where everybody knows your name," right? Mm -hmm. so 
It makes, yeah. you, makes you feel welcome and comfortable, right? So I think that was the key for us. That reminds me of one step further when Starbucks, they always ask for people's names, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, what's your name? What's your name? And that was the big thing in retail. But the next step to that is knowing their names ahead of time 100%, and saying, yeah. hey, John, how's it going? You know, how it's, was, you know, your birthday last week or whatever it is, right? Yeah. It, it does make a difference because it's, so it, it's more of a friendly environment, right? You call friends by their names, right? Yeah. So, and then um, our name is like the word we're most used to hearing. Exactly. All our life, right? So, yeah. Yeah. And it, it makes them feel like, hey, I'm important to these people. They actually gave a, a shit and remembered my name. And yeah. not many people do that. There's a, there's a line in the book, uh, How to Win Friends, uh, friends and Influence People. Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the first sentences was, you know, uh, a, a person's name is their favorite name in the English it's language. The same, or, you know, whatever language it is, right? It's their favorite word. Yeah, their name, yeah. everyone's name is usually their favorite word in their, Everyone alphabet, likes in their language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Everyone has gone by, you know, you're walking through a crowd and you just yeah. hear somebody saying they might not even be speaking to you. But, yeah. you know, your head is whipping, turning around. You're like, oh, <laughs> I thought they were talking to me. Right. So, yeah. no, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um. So um, I know that this is a. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a bigger topic in the States, but it seems to be um, a lot of things that's going on in the States. They're having to deal with shrinking profit margins due to competition, due to taxation and all those different things. Are you experiencing the same with your stores with more and more people popping up? You might have alluded to it previously, mentioning that the dispensaries are now kind of turning into the convenience store, a model where, you know, people are just going to the one that's most convenient to them. Are you experiencing those same things yourself? A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Our, uh, I think the way the government kind of rolled out our cannabis stores here in Ontario, uh, you can't blame them. They never had the foresight to see how things were going to turn out. But honestly, that the way that they rolled out the lottery in the beginning, and the, you know, only twenty five stores were allowed to open, and then another lottery after that. There's a lot of people that got into this industry because it looked like an easy business to do it's you're buying from the government and you're selling to customers right it's like a, a liquor store kind of concept yeah. right they're not hard businesses to run and all of a sudden like the lottery stores open and you're seeing lineups hour-long lineups of customers trying to get into these stores and the newspapers and media are publishing sales numbers of fifty sixty thousand dollars a day in sales that these stores are doing and there's a lot of people that are like, oh, my God, it only costs a couple hundred thousand dollars to open up one of these stores. Like, to many people, like a couple hundred thousand dollars is not a lot of money, especially if you own some properties or yeah. something like that. And at that time, interest rates were really low. It's more so, so access could, to capital than it is a hundred, yeah. two hundred, five hundred thousand yeah. dollars in the bank account, right? Yeah. So it was like easy. You say, hey, I'll just get a line. Like, property prices are going up. And mortgage rates are really low. Let me just go get a few hundred thousand dollars out of line of credit on my house and try to open up a store because this looks like a an easy business. And I know so many people that have no clue about cannabis that uh, that got into it. And I was one of those people, right? I was just <laughs> like, oh my god, this is this is like a no brainer. But then all of a sudden, there's like seventeen hundred stores, and then the big guys, the corporate chains, also came in and they wanted to compete and. I guess they had longer term visions of kind of dominating the markets and they would do their price wars and try to get uh, their pricing to be low. And that was their key differentiator and saying, we're going to offer the cheapest price possible to compete with the independents. And then slowly, slowly choke them out. And once the market uh, settles after five, six years, then there'll only be maybe five, six players in the market. And, uh, Let's see if that uh, philosophy works. It's kind of, uh, I used to be totally thinking it's not going to work, but I'm like on the fence now, right? It's, uh, 
But before we get into that, I've realized that after all of these interviews, dispensary owners need a safe space where they can ask the questions that Google doesn't have the answers for. So what I've done is I've created the world's first dispensary owners mastermind group, where it's an environment of like-minded individuals who can help make each other's lives easier and also make more money in the process. So if that's something that you're interested in, please check out the links in the description below. Now on to the rest of the show. What's, uh, uh, it's, what's it's changed your mind with, about it? It's, uh, it's hard to compete with uh, big, big chains that have a lot of money that can afford to lose money for year after year, especially if they're a public company mm -hmm. go, going to get their money. And then they also have access to uh, the data fees. They're, because they have so much buying power, they're able to kind of, I don't think extorting it from LPs is the right word for it, but like force them to pay them to sell their products, right? I own five yeah. stores, but somebody else that has 150, you can say, hey, you got to pay me if you want to be in my stores, right? You got to pay me a lot of money. And yeah. uh, brands are realizing, yeah, they have to pay. So I've known some stores that make, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand $20,000 a month just on those data fees mm -hmm. without doing any sales. And typically to run a store, it costs you twenty to $25,000. So if you've got like 75, 80% of your costs covered just on extra revenue, then uh, you can lower your prices and margins uh, substantially to get to win more customers over as well. So right. that right. becomes a challenge for the independents that they don't have that uh, ability to do that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you own five stores, and yeah. that means you have to staff five stores. Yes. And um, as you've probably learned in the retail space, that um, the front facing workers are of utmost importance because they're the ones actually interacting with customers. Like you said, 100%. you need to train them. You need to make sure that they know people's names, so on and so forth. So yeah. how do you deal with your relationship with staff? How do you make sure that they're performing at you know a high level? They're making sure that they're good with their customers. Like what is your way to be able to ensure that all of your different stores are maintained at a level of standard that you're looking to achieve? Well, I have uh, a manager for each store mm -hmm. and I stay closely in touch with the managers. We meet uh, once or twice a week uh, and really go through the operations, making sure that the way that we want to operate the store, that they're able to manage their, their staff that way. Right. I, I usually don't have a lot of time to, deal with the butt tenders and uh, the front facing stuff. Uh, and if five stores was the only thing I had, then <laughs> I probably would be doing it. But, you know, I'm doing like five, six, seven other ventures. In Serial this entrepreneur. As, as well too, right? And, <laughs> and uh, so then I don't have that luxury to be in the stores all the time and dealing with the butt tenders and customer. I do come to my Etobicoke and Mississauga stores uh, the most, just because they happen to be like 20 minutes away from where I live. So mm -hmm. uh, sometimes instead of working from home, I'll just go to the store and work. Like today I'm at the Tobico store. Right. I'll just kind of hang out here. And even though I'm doing my work, my ears are still in the in the store, paying attention to how conversations are being had and whatnot. If I notice something that uh, could be done better, I will go and do a little coaching to uh, to the butt tender and say, hey, you know what, next time this happens, use this words and this language instead of the way that you said it. And it might have been a better, a better experience. Right, right, so, right. Because sometimes they don't know, right? They're like, most of them are, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, right? So they, they are where I was when I started my first entrepreneurial journey, right? And uh, I don't mind uh, sharing some of the, the life lessons I've learned with them. As well, too. well, the incentives are completely different, right? You know, mm -hmm. you're the 19, 20 year old, you're like, hey, you know, in two years, I'm going to be a millionaire. You yeah. know, like it's, it's those sorts of thoughts. It's like, you know, yeah. I'm going to achieve X, right? And I think that's great, right? But um, a, a lot and of times. I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up in that society. You're right. It was right. so weird. When we were 20 years old, we never had the thought, I didn't even think I could be a millionaire. <laughs> But now, and we know, like, to be one takes a lot of work. Like, you got a lot. But nowadays, the generation is more like, here, invest $20, and it'll turn into a million. 
by buying this cryptocurrency or something like that, right? There's much more of a, a get rich quick type of mentality than uh, the way it used to be where you got to like work hard and right. save money and then you'll become a millionaire, right? Well, it's a lot of those things, right? Like we say working hard, discipline, so on and so forth. But like, what does that actually mean? Right. You know, it means showing up to work early on time every single day. Right. Yeah. Being able to weather the bad storms and enjoy the good ones. Right. Yeah. It's 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 being able to enjoy the journey that you have instead of wishing that what you have right now isn't good enough. And you're always trying to get the next thing immediately with that instant 100%. gratification. Yeah. And it's a lesson that you can't necessarily learn immediately because mm -hmm. it's something that just grows and grows and grows over time. You're like, ah, okay. So these are the habits that I need to instill in myself in order to get this, whatever, this arbitrary million dollars, right? Yeah. Just like you don't go to the gym immediately and then say, oh, why am I not Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yeah, where's my six and pack? Why am I not <laughs> exactly, right. Where's yeah. my six pack? It's like, no, you need daily discipline. You need good sleep. You need to eat well. You need to do all yeah. these things. But for whatever reason, when it comes to money, <laughs> people are like, yeah, you know, in two years, I'm going to be a millionaire. And it's this 19-year-old, yeah. 20-year-old, whatever, 21-year-old coming out of school, right? Um, and I'm not to say the, I don't they, fall they see, to that I think, I think they see that, though, right? It's because the world is small and uh, social media plays a big part of it. And everyone's yes. kind of showing a fake lifestyle, right? They'll rent yes. a house or just like go into an empty house that they don't even own and pretend like they own it. And yeah. uh, we we are, social media makes you jealous and want to keep up with the Joneses type of thing, right? And uh, yeah. it's kind of can become toxic and it's created these mentalities in people. Yeah, yeah. Well, because look, like our world is uh, the perception of what we see around us, like, you know, mm. literally in front of us, right? You know, I yeah, see you, yeah. you see me, so on and so forth. We don't see the person five blocks down the street doing whatever they're doing with their life. But mm. all of a sudden with, you know, we have these phones and social media. Now we're seeing the 21 year olds with the Lamborghinis and yeah. the Ferraris and the massive mansions, not knowing any context. Maybe it's their rich friends, right? Maybe yeah. they're renting it exactly what you said. Mm. And then yeah. all of a sudden, you start associating yourself with these people that you see on social media. And it's like, ah, you know, um, you know, I, I want that. I want these things. So it's tricky. Mm -hmm. Look, um, I think for as difficult things are back in the day, it's just a different type of difficult now. You know, you, yeah. you're, you're trying to keep up. There's a lot of comparison. There's social media. There's a lot more anxieties in the world. Um, we were talking about it earlier about um, the speed at which things move at, right? You know, it takes a month to kind of get the information from one side of the world to another. Now it's instantaneous, Instant, right? You know yeah. exactly what happens at that time. And yeah. you also, with the good, you also get the bad, right? You get the good news instantaneously, but you also get the bad news instantaneously. And now people are, are just slowly, you know, trying to, to trying to live with all those things. So, yeah. you know. And, and I think people's attention span has gone down yes. substantially. So they don't have the ability to actually go deep and actually try to learn anything. It's all just headlines and snippets and, yeah. and little tags, right? And yeah. they think they can get the news by watching something on TikTok for eight seconds and they understand <laughs> what's going on, right? That's not how things work. Right? What's worse is they then execute on the thing that they learned for eight seconds. Yeah. They're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'm just going to, you know, my world is now shaped <laughs> by this eight seconds, right? There's no nuance. Yeah. There's no context. You don't even yeah. know who's saying it on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, absolutely crazy. I've had um, this conversation with people that, uh, like I love studying world history and politics and all the news, uh, just about the Israel Gaza war. Mm -hmm. And they have all these strong opinions and this and that. And I would just ask them, go, do you even know where it is in the world? Can you tell <laughs> me, like, describe to me whereabouts it is? Right. They don't even know where these countries are. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. But and they're uh, absolutely yeah, they're outraged. Outraged. It's <laughs> outraged. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's. Yeah, look, this could be. Remember the the, the first question I asked before at the yeah. beginning of the conversation. We could definitely go there, but no, we could we can save that. <laughs> but uh, you know, kind of uh, bringing it back on the cannabis um, space. So opportunity, um, that's where people go, right? You know, you're talking about people making fifty thousand, sixty thousand dollars in a day, being able to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars, especially with the low interest rates. It was pretty easy, and now we're seeing a lot of growing competition with 
one, the people who had access to capital and two, the people who had even more access to capital with really, really deep pockets, right? Yeah. So what are you doing or what are you trying to do to kind of help shield yourself from, you know, all of this kind of competition coming into the space? I'm lucky that I have the benefit of having like five. And you know me, when you have five, you if you get lucky, you get one or two good ones. And then you get a couple of donkeys as well, too, right? So yeah. everybody, everybody kind of has that. And then the one or two good ones can help kind of support the other ones. Uh, right now, most retailers are kind of like in a survival type of mode, saying mm -hmm. if we survive the next year, hopefully after next year, there'll be two, three, four hundred stores that shut down. And then the market, that those customers are going to get redistributed and hopefully our sales go a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody has these gold rush or green rush visions anymore that it's they're going to be able to retire and uh, cash out for millions and millions of dollars. Uh, most independents that I know are expecting that their sales will remain stable or if they were doing really well last year, their numbers have declined substantially mm -hmm. this year, right? So it's kind of in that survival mode. Uh, and the partial reason for that survival mode is the majority of the people that got into this industry uh, that didn't win the lottery, they uh, they signed their leases in the second half of 2020. And the stores started opening in 2021. Mm -hmm. Most of them were towards the very end of 2020. So most people signed like five-year leases. So those five-year leases are going to come up for renewal next year. Mm -hmm. And typically, you've got to tell the landlord six months in advance whether you're mm -hmm. going to renew or not. And uh, I, I made the same mistake that many other people made. In the beginning, landlords didn't want to give uh, spaces for lease. They were very anti-cannabis. And you took what you could get. You didn't say, is this the best possible location, this and that. Right. Like, oh, my God. Like The landlord's actually saying yes. And some landlords actually were charging double rent. Ooh. And people paid. I have lots of friends that are paying double the market rent, all because they had seen another guy making thirty thousand dollars, forty thousand dollars a day, and they're like, "Oh, I don't care if my rent is five grand or ten grand. If I'm going to make twenty grand a day, it doesn't matter, right? I'll pay it." But then that's not how things panned out. So many of these people are going to be like, "There's no way in hell I'm going to renew that lease mm -hmm. uh, for that rate." And many people also got into franchise agreements, the ones that didn't know what they were doing. They just, you know, got franchises thinking, here's a few hundred thousand dollars. I'll let this franchise teach me about the industry. And then those deals are all falling apart uh, now as well, too, because people are realizing that the, the franchise model isn't working as successfully in cannabis as it does in some of the other industries, just because the margins aren't there. We have mm -hmm. prices going down. OCS is like reduce. You know, trying to find products that are cheap and affordable for people. And uh, rents are going up, minimum wage is going up. So you have all your expenses going up on one way and prices are going down and there's more and more stores. So like it's just, it's going to be a little, little bit of uh, a mess for a little bit, I think. Right. So where do you see the future of the cannabis industry heading? From what perspective? Retail or LP or? Honestly, like just overall. Right. So um, in terms of retail is a, is a good one. You alluded retail, to I a, see, a lot of this I stuff see, earlier. I see consolidation happening. People have been mm -hmm. saying it for a few years and uh, I was new to retail, so I didn't think it was going to be possible, but I mm -hmm. see consolidation happening. I see a lot of stores uh, closing down and uh, I was just actually having this conversation with a friend the other day and, he asked me, he goes, in which other industry are there strong independents out there at a retail level? And honestly, I couldn't name any industries. Mm -hmm. They're like, why would it be any different for cannabis? So eventually there might be, you know, five, six, seven big chains that have like 80 to 90% of the stores. And then you'll get the odd good store that uh, has an independent here and there, right? So. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it it'll probably play out uh, play out like that. Right, right. Do you? It just grew you... too fast, right? The market just like when it skyrockets, it has to come down and then kind of stabilize uh, afterwards, right? And uh, 
a lot of these people that weren't in it, they were only in it for the money and it was just a couple hundred thousand dollars. They'd be like, you know what? Like I gave it a shot five years. Either I made some money, maybe they made, got their money out already. Then it's like, it's not worth the headache. It's not worth it to run a store to make a couple thousand bucks, especially if I've got another business on the side that is taking, this is taking attention away from, then I might as well just shut it down and, uh, and do that business because they weren't really emotionally attached to the industry or had the passion for it anyway. It was just a business opportunity right. to throw in right. some money at it. Right? So. Yeah, it's it's interesting because similarly on the level of kind of like the get rich quick thing, not saying that mm-hmm. opening up a dispensary was a get rich quick thing, but it was an opportunity that I think a lot of people saw that they thought they could, you know, make a lot of money from. Right. Yeah. And nobody knew. <laughs> nobody knew what would happen in the future but now we'll see you know like you said things go up things go down and then it'll probably <clears throat> normalize in the middle somewhat right um the the better uh, operators that are running a profitable business or at least mm-hmm. able to survive in you know now they're tougher times are now going to start to excel should the market kind of creep back up yeah. Um, so, you know, overall, that's the case. I, I would say I'm overall optimistic, right? At the end of the day, it's, there is. I think overall, in... the industry will grow. Yes. Like overall, the industry is definitely going to grow. I think yeah. uh, there will be a lot of collateral damage yes. along the way for yeah. it, right? And people may have to like restructure their stores. Maybe it can't be you can operate as an independent. Maybe 50, 60 independents get together and create their own chain as well too and then have the advantages of being a bigger chain right 100 so, percent. yeah many different things can still happen but overall i think the industry is here to stay i think there's room lots of room for growth uh in the industry as well too mm-hmm. from a consumer mm-hmm. side as well and uh hopefully if the government understands some of these challenges that exist now if they can maybe make some uh changes to the regulations to kind of give people a fair chance right one simple thing could have been like you can't have a dispensary beside each other like one store has to be you know minimum 500 or a thousand meters away from another store right that that would have kind of created a little bit of a safety net but you know you go downtown toronto and there's like six stores side by side by side by side right it's not you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that they all can survive especially if they're all buying the same products from the same source right it'd be different if there were maybe a clothing store and somebody can say we're children's clothing we're women's clothing we're men's clothing we're streetwear we're formal well like you can totally differentiate it that way but uh, cannabis is a little bit unique that way it's not like i can grow my own weed and sell it in my own store that that product is not available anywhere else either that could be something that could be unique. It's like this store has unique weed because they grow their own. And now I'll go out of my way to go in, to this place because I like their products. Right? So, but we're not there yet. Who knows? Maybe we'll be one day. Soon, soon. I, like, yeah. I think when you take a look at this industry in comparison to just literally any other retail, right? Hmm. Whether it's the wine or the beers or tobacco or clothes or just literally anything, right? Like hmm. it's still babies, right? Yeah. <laughs> there, There is no differentiation. It's still more so a commodity and the market, you know, needs to kind of mature. Um, the buyers will also mature. The stigma even more so, will, you know, will be decreased so overall again i'm optimistic but like you said there will be collateral collateral damage in terms of you know what's going to happen with some of the retail stores but i would say this is very much not even part one but the prequel of kind of what the future of the cannabis industry is you know going to look like you know so um what advice would you give yourself if you were to start all over again in this industry in this industry oh if i knew they always <laughs> say if you know what you knew then back what you know yeah now, hindsight's I would, 2020 i i wouldn't have got in Interesting. No, definitely would not. It would have stayed in real estate and uh, and not got in. Right? Would you say you fell victim to shiny object syndrome? Yeah. 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 Now, and that happens to a lot of people in every industry, right? It's, uh, right. Yeah. So it's How... almost like now we're like stuck in it. So you got to make the best. Of... <laughs> Of best what it is, and that's why I have like so many different ventures within 100%. the industry. So, to figure out okay, I got a big hole over here, maybe I can cover it from 
from over here or like try to solve different problems and uh, mm. and find success that way rather than just this one thing and all my eggs are in this one basket now like, so right yeah how would one figure out whether something is shiny object syndrome or whether it's actually time to move on to the next thing because you know you have started a bunch of different businesses a bunch of mm -hmm. different ventures so i think you'd be well equipped to answer something like this because Again, right? Is it time to just move on to the next chapter of something that I want to do, something that I'm more passionate in, something that I have more interest in, um, something that is uh, has more opportunity financially, right? Or does it make sense to kind of like stay put? Um, you're you, you're good at what you're good at. Stay in your own lane and just try and make that thing the best it possibly can be. Like, what's the balance between those two? And have you figured that out over the course of your you know entrepreneurial career? This is my first like shiny object uh, business. Uh... A lot of the other ones, especially when it was like the media and newspapers, we created industries that didn't exist. Mm. Well, well, newspapers existed, but they didn't exist for our community kind of thing. Correct. Right? So we created things that were new and unique. Uh, I've had like the law firms and whatnot. So that was not new and unique, but they were stable industries, right? Uh, I prefer now to like, not deal in regulated businesses because sometimes when you have the handcuffs of the government on you it becomes really really challenging look at mm -hmm. like our marketing and all these rules when it comes to cannabis that we can't do that if i owned uh, you know any other type of store if i owned a cell phone shop or perfume shops or something like that i could do literally whatever i wanted to do right and uh, if my marketing skills were strong i could really grow that business quite quite a bit, right? Whereas right. you don't have that same opportunity here right. for right. it. So we have this um, cool segment on our show where we ask a previous dispensary owner a question they have for the next guest. And mm -hmm. then I'll ask you what question you have for the next guest. Okay. So uh, this a uh, question, this one isn't too crazy. I think you got off pretty easy on this one. Um, mm -hmm. This one's from Aram Stoney from Big Sur Botanicals. Um, he's out in California. And okay. he just asked, uh, what's your favorite category and why? Like, so is it an ed edibles, flowers, tinctures, concentrates, beverages? Personally, to consume, uh, I, and I think the category that's probably going to be the winner in the long run is going to be vapes and potentially okay. disposable vapes. I personally don't use many disposable vapes, but I, I don't consume that much. I only consume at nighttime, mm -hmm. uh, usually in bed before I do my meditation, one or two puffs. So I find the discretion, it's, I can do it in bed, right? I don't have to go outside and smoke and this and that. Right? So I think that's going to be, uh, for me, that's the best category. Uh, the reason why I think it's going to grow is the kids nowadays that are 15, 16, 17 years old, they are already vaping. They're mm -hmm. used to the vaping uh, uh, lifestyle. And many of them don't really know or care about the history of cannabis, mm. the culture of cannabis. They're not the ritual of grinding weed and, and smoking. And all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and... they just want to get high, right? So yeah. it's a convenient way to get high for them, right? So, uh, and I think that's why they'll go and tend to go with stuff that they're comfortable and uh, used to doing. And it's mm -hmm. discreet. They can take it to school and like go to the washroom and have a puff and, nobody will know right, so right it doesn't right. smell or anything like that so I, I can see growth in that side of the industry for sure mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh what question would you have for the next guest owner that i interview i normally like to ask like challenging questions but like what, feel free you, you can if, ask yeah, as challenging you, as, as much if, as you'd like if you had the ear of the government and could change three different regulations that would drastically impact your business what would they be Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's a really good one. I, I like yeah. that one. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, and lastly, where can people find you if they want to get in touch? So Jazz, uh, Jazz Samra on, uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, my stores are called Sativa Bliss. And I've got a new brand coming out called Astro Boys. It's been all over the media there as well, too. So yeah, I'm not hard to find. Just type in Jazz Samra on Google. And uh, I'll be there. But LinkedIn is uh, where a lot of people that don't know me personally contact me, and I'm very easy to get in touch with. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jazz, yeah. uh, thank you so much for hopping on this episode of the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm your host, Brandon Kwan, and I'll talk to you guys on the next one. See you guys later. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. My name is Brandon Kwan, and I'm the founder of Cannabud Marketing, the number one marketing agency of choice for dispensaries, both in the United States and in Canada. If you ever want to get in touch with me about any marketing strategies, tips, and tricks, I can definitely help you. Just go visit our website at cannabudmarketing.com. That's C A N N A B U D marketing.com, or just check the links in the description below. Until next time, talk to you later. Bye.